Kingsbury Run is a neighborhood on the southeast side of Cleveland, Ohio, whose main feature is a natural watershed that drains into the Cuyahoga River. During the 1930s, ravaged by the Great Depression, the area was mainly full of shanty towns that were home to transients, addicts, and other vulnerable people condemned to reside on the bottom run of society. Unfortunately, these characteristics also made them easy targets for anyone looking for victims. 4. You see, Cleveland also had a monster. He was real life, flesh and blood like you and me, and his savage actions would make them make believe monsters of fairy tales pale in comparison. The horror began on September 23, 1935, when two boys were spending a nice, sunny afternoon climbing an embankment in Kingsbury Run called Jackass Hill. The sight that met them when they reached the top caused both to scream and flee in terror, searching for the nearest adult. It was the naked body of a man and he didn't have a head. Detectives Orly May and Emil Musel were the first police to arrive on the scene. While investigating the area, they quickly made another grisly discovery. It was a second victim who, like the first, had also been beheaded, washed and drained of blood. The official police report described the scene. The bodies of two white men, both beheaded, lying in the weeds, both bodies were naked except that one of them had socks on. After an extensive search the heads of both men were found buried in separate places, one about 20 feet away from one of the bodies and the other head was buried about 75 feet away from the other body. Both men's genitals had been severed from their bodies and were found near one of the heads. We also found an old blue coat, light cap and a blood-stained union suit. Nearby was a metal bucket containing a small quantity of oil and a torch. It was apparent that oil, acid or some chemical was poured over one of the bodies as it was burnt to quite an extent, it was also evident that both bodies had been there several days as they had started to decompose. The first victim was named Edward Andrassy. He was a 28-year-old former orderly who used to work at the psychiatric ward of Cleveland City Hospital. At the time of his murder, though, he was unemployed and his wife had left him. He ended up being one of the few victims of the mad butcher who were ever identified. The police had his fingerprints on file as Andrassy had several run-ins with the law. As his father put it, Edward associated with people of questionable character. He had been arrested once on a concealed weapons charge and had been picked up for intoxication multiple times. He dealt in pornography, he got into trouble with gangsters in Detroit and even had an angry husband out for his blood after sleeping with his wife. In other words, nobody was really shocked that Andrassy eventually ended up murdered, although the circumstances were a bit of a surprise. The second victim remains an unidentified John Doe, or Victim 1, as he was referred to in the investigation. He was a middle-aged man, between 40 and 45 years of age, about 5 feet 6 inches tall, 165 pounds, with dark brown hair. What was established was that he was the mad butcher's first likely victim. While Edward Andrassy had been sitting in the grass for two to three days before he was discovered, initial estimates for John Doe I said that he had been murdered seven to ten days prior. These estimates were later revised even further, concluding that he had been killed and dumped weeks before Andrassy, but the chemical agent that his body was treated with caused it to become leathery and slowed down decomposition. Lab analysis also revealed another gruesome detail, both men were still alive when they had been decapitated. Since Andrassy was the only one of the two victims who was identified, police focused their investigation on his last days. He left his home on Thursday evening and was murdered the following night, with his body being discovered on Monday afternoon. Unfortunately, detectives couldn't track down anyone who saw or spoke with Andrassy after he left home, nor could they find any connections to another missing person who could have been victim one. After a few weeks of investigations, the authorities reached some conclusions regarding the case. Both men were killed by the same person. This person used a sharp knife for the dismemberment and made clean cuts, showing knowledge and experience. These were crimes of passion and weren't related to any criminal rackets. They were committed somewhere else and the victims were brought to Kingsbury Run after the fact, with the killer being strong enough to carry the bodies up the steep embankment of Jackass Hill as an automobile could not climb that way. While this may have had the makings of a decent start for a criminal profile, it was nowhere near good enough to identify the murderer. 
With no other leads to follow, the police only had one choice, wait for another body. As it turned out, they may have already had it. Traditionally, 12 victims are ascribed to the mad butcher, but some researchers believe he may have murdered more and the first one actually predated the two bodies found on Jackass Hill. On September 5, 1934, the lower half of a woman's torso washed up on the shore near Euclid Beach Park at Lake Erie. It had been in the water for three to four months and had an odd coloration which resulted from being treated chemically. Despite the clear similarities, police at the time never investigated this as part of the Mad Butcher's murders. The woman was only retroactively named as possibly being his first victim, becoming known as the Lady of the Lake or Victim Zero. The next murder came in late January, 1936. It was another woman, showing that the Mad Butcher had no preference when it came to gender. Parts of her body had been wrapped carefully in newspaper and left on the street in half-bushel baskets. The other parts were found days later in an empty lot, carelessly discarded against a fence. Her head was never recovered, but she was identified through her fingerprints. She was Florence Flo Palillo, a 42-year-old waitress who had been arrested a few times for prostitution, and also the only other victim apart from Andresi to be positively identified. Those who knew Flo liked her. She was usually friendly and kind, exceptions being when she drank heavily, which apparently happened quite often. Because of this, her marriage fell apart and she had to resort to prostitution to make ends meet. Like Andresi, she mainly surrounded herself with dubious characters like pimps, madams, bootlickers, and drug addicts and none could provide police with clues as to what happened to Flo before her disappearance. The investigation into her death soon hit a wall like the others. Perhaps because the idea of a serial killer was still relatively new, the authorities were still not treating these murders as the work of the same culprit because they lacked a common motive. The two men found on Jackass Hill were killed by the same person but, as far as they were concerned, Flo Palillo and the Lady of the Lake were unconnected crimes. With no leads, it was only a matter of time before the killer struck again. On the morning of June 5, 1936, two boys were passing through Kingsbury Run, on their way fishing, when they saw a pair of pants bunched up and thrown into a bush. They prodded it with their fishing poles and the head of a man came rolling out. The next day, authorities found the man's body, placed in some bushes very close to an office of the railroad police. Whether this was a coincidence or the killer's way of taunting the police, we don't know. The victim was a man in his early to mid-twenties. Despite being found near shanty towns, he did not look like he belonged there. He was well-groomed, clean, well-fed, and had been wearing nice, new clothes which were dumped in a pile next to his naked body. His underwear had the initials J.D. on them. More distinctly, though, the young man had six tattoos, some of them with elements which suggested that he may have been a sailor. In a very unusual move, the police made a death mask of the victim and presented it alongside a chart of his tattoos in an exhibit at the Great Lakes Exposition, the World Fair that took place in Cleveland just a few weeks after his murder. Their thinking was that his face would be seen by hundreds of thousands of people and, hopefully, someone would recognize it. Unfortunately, they had no luck. Despite the death mask, despite the tattoos, and the initials, and the fingerprints, the victim remained unidentified, becoming known as the Tattooed Man. Also around this time, the police were increasingly becoming forced to face an unpleasant reality that there was a single madman in Cleveland who was killing all these people by cutting their heads off. It was the coroner's office that first took this position. The decapitations, the precision of the cuts, the cleaning and disposing of the bodies, they all suggested one culprit. However, again, serial killers were still a novel concept back then, one that the investigators led by Sergeant James Hogan, head of the Homicide Division, either didn't consider or, more likely, preferred to ignore. They wanted their murders to fall into neat little boxes. The two men found dead on Jackass Hill, a woman had to be involved somehow. The bodies dumped near shanty towns, clearly part of some kind of criminal activity like drugs or prostitution. It was with extreme reluctance that they finally admitted that the crimes were the work of one crazed killer, persuaded by a man with an untouchable character. Undoubtedly, as if the gruesomeness of the murders wasn't enough, 
Another element that fanned the flames of public interest was the involvement of Elliot Ness, former Prohibition agent and the leader of the Untouchables. By this point, he was already famous in the country for his role in taking down Al Capone in Chicago. Even though he was still in his early 30s, Ness was clearly regarded as the new, up-and-coming golden boy. Once Prohibition ended, Cleveland Mayor Harold Burton hired him as the city's safety director, giving him authority over the police and fire departments. Burton himself had been elected on a platform of cracking down on crime and corruption so, obviously, nobody fitted the role better than Elliot Ness. This happened in December, 1935, by which point the Mad Butcher already claimed several victims that were still being investigated as separate murders. Because of Elliot Ness's high profile, his involvement in the Torso murders has been exaggerated over the years. His position was mainly administrative, he rarely took an active role in the case. Not to mention the fact that his focus was on tackling large-scale issues such as corruption, drugs, and gambling, not one lunatic with a knife. Even so, he was persuaded by the coroner that the beheadings were the work of just one man and instructed the homicide division to investigate the crimes as being committed by a single killer. In the meantime, the murderer continued his spree unimpeded. Another male victim was found just a month and a half after the tattooed man, although he had actually been killed months before. He was in an advanced state of decomposition and remained unidentified, but there were two unique elements about this crime. One, it occurred in the Big Creek area in southwest Cleveland, far removed from Kingsbury Run. And two, there was a large puddle of dried blood under the corpse. That was where he had been murdered, while the other victims had all been dumped in different locations. For some reason that we still don't know, on this particular occasion, the killer strayed pretty far from his usual modus operandi, although, ultimately, it did not yield any useful leads for the authorities. By this point, the police were looking for one murderer, but the press and the people did not know that yet, even though there were newspaper headlines which speculated that the city had a madman whose strange god is the guillotine. For the moment, Elliot Ness was providing them with all the headlines and snapshots they needed by staging raids on gambling dens and taking down corrupt officials. However, the next victim alerted the entire nation that Cleveland had a serial killer in its midst. The body was found on September 10, 1936, when a vagrant saw two halves of a torso floating in a stagnant pool of water by the creek. Police and rescue units soon arrived on the scene and used lawn hooks to try and recover other parts of the body and items of clothing. As the hours passed, hundreds of onlookers gathered to see the morbid show. The media then arrived to ask questions and take pictures. There was no way to hide the story of the torso murders anymore. Soon enough, the papers even had a name for the killer, the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. From this point on, Elliot Ness became more involved in the case, something which he kind of resented since it wasn't what he signed up for and because it took him away from his other duties where he was markedly more successful. Although nowadays he is famous for his work as a prohibition agent against Al Capone thanks to the book, the TV series, and the movie All Called the Untouchables, in his own time this success faded from public memory and he became chiefly remembered for his failure to catch the Mad Butcher. In his position, there was little that Ness could do other than dedicate more resources to the case. He assigned a unit of 20 detectives working full-time to catch the killer, plus countless patrolmen. He told them to investigate every tip, no matter how trivial or crazy, and he put out a reward for information leading to the Mad Butcher's arrest. Some of the detectives went undercover as vagrants, while others posed as gay men in bars and steam baths, hoping they might luck into the killer's hunting grounds. Of particular note here was a detective named Peter Marillo. He was considered intelligent but eccentric, spoke multiple languages, and was tenacious in his pursuits, sometimes bordering on obsessive. He and his partner personally interviewed over 1,500 people for this case, which included all the strangest suspects whose profiles ended on their desks. Among them were a giant man who walked around Kingsbury Run with a kitchen knife, another man who claimed he was a voodoo doctor and that he possessed a death ray, and, last but certainly not least, a man who liked to hire prostitutes and pleasure himself while watching them cut the heads off chickens. Despite their efforts, the police made no headway in their case and the mad butcher claimed another three victims the following year.
The first was a woman found in February, 1937, on the shore of Lake Erie, in almost the same spot as the Lady of the Lake back in 1934. The second victim was mostly a skeleton because, even though she was found in June, 1937, she had been killed a year prior. Despite this, she had been unofficially identified as a missing woman named Rose Wallace thanks to her dental work but, again, this did not lead anywhere promising. The third and final victim of the year was a man whose headless remains were pulled out of the Cuyahoga River a month later. The last three victims were all found in 1938. They were two women and one man, all remaining unidentified. The last two were discovered on the same day, very close to each other although they had been killed months apart. Those were the final victims officially ascribed to the Mad Butcher, but there were thoughts that he simply started killing someplace else. Whenever a killer stopped suddenly, there are three common possibilities. They died, they were imprisoned on an unrelated charge, or they moved away. Detective Peter Marillo believed the Mad Butcher hopped boxcars and started a new spree in Pennsylvania. The city of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, had a swamp nearby which had been used ever since the 1920s as a body dumping ground. During the late 1930s, early 1940s, several headless victims were found at that location and people such as Marillo concluded that the so-called murder swamp killer and the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run were one and the same. This claim was investigated by the coroner's office and the police, but was never proven. As far as Elliot Ness was concerned, he became distressed and reckless due to mounting public pressure to stop the killer. On August 18, 1938, just two days after the last victims were discovered, he organized a massive raid on the shanty towns of Kingsbury Run. He had all the vagrants rounded up and then he burned the place to the ground so they could not return. It was the last act of a desperate man with no other cards left to play. Ness was severely condemned in the newspapers for this extreme action, but the thing is that the Mad Butcher never struck again. We're not saying there is any direct correlation between the two, we're just pointing it out. The Mad Butcher may have eluded capture but, as far as Elliot Ness and a few other detectives were concerned, they identified their killer, they just were not able to find evidence to take him to court. One important talking point during the investigation was the extent of the murderer's anatomical knowledge. He always made precise cuts on the bodies of his victims, knowing exactly where to slice. So was he somebody with medical experience, or perhaps someone with a more basic training, like an actual butcher? At one point, the coroner working the case, Dr. Samuel Gerber, expressed his belief that the killer was probably a doctor, so the investigation began focusing on them. Detectives started looking into medical professionals in Cleveland with a history for any kind of licentious behavior such as arrests for substance abuse or soliciting prostitutes. That is how they arrived at Dr. Francis Sweeney. He was an alcoholic prone to violent outbursts when he drank. He grew up in Kingsbury Run and had lost his marriage and his job due to his drinking problem. Physically, he fit the profile of the mad butcher because he was very tall and strong. On several occasions, the killer had to carry the bodies of his victims up steep hills, so the police were convinced early on that he had to be a man of imposing stature. This all seemed promising, but the investigators had two factors working against them. One, Francis Sweeney was a cousin of Congressman Martin Sweeney. The latter was a political opponent of Mayor Burton and Elliot Ness and allegedly used his influence to impede the investigation of his cousin. The second problem was that Sweeney often checked himself into a veteran's hospital for his alcoholism and some of his stays coincided with the Mad Butcher's murders. This was enough to take the focus off Sweeney for a while, at least until one detective thought to look into the veteran's hospital alibi more closely. He discovered that because Sweeney was a doctor and because he always admitted himself voluntarily, he was pretty much free to come and go as he pleased and nobody kept close tabs on him. Because of this, the investigation concentrated on him again, but never yielded anything solid apart from a few failed polygraph tests and one supposed tense interrogation between Ness and Sweeney where the former flat-out said that he believed Sweeney was the killer, prompting the accused to grin from ear to ear, stand up to show his massive frame and then simply telling Ness, prove it. For reasons still unknown today, Francis Sweeney began checking into hospitals on a more permanent basis. From August, 1938, 
Until his death, he moved from hospital to hospital across the country and, on occasion, he sent rambling postcards to Elliot Ness. Again, this happened shortly after the last victims of the Mad Butcher were found. Although this was pure speculation, some believe that his family forced him to do it to stop the murders while, at the same time, avoiding the scandal of a trial. There was one other noteworthy suspect, a 52-year-old bricklayer named Frank Dolichal who was arrested in 1939 for the murder of Flo Polilo. He gave a very strange confession which was part rambling, part specific details, which was later insinuated to have been coerced while Dolichal was in the custody of the county sheriff's department. He was later found dead in his cell, allegedly from hanging himself, and an autopsy revealed numerous bruises and broken ribs. Nobody's really sure why the sheriff's department went so hard at Dolishal with almost no evidence. Some even floated the idea that they were under orders from someone higher up the food chain who wanted another suspect other than Francis Sweeney. Well, if this is true, they didn't get it. Nobody else seriously bought Dolishal as a suspect for the mad butcher. Even his so-called confession only admitted to killing Flo Polilo in self-defense when she attacked him with a knife. The investigation lost steam pretty soon after the murder stopped. Elliot Ness and many men on his team had no doubts that Sweeney was their killer so, apart from keeping tabs on him, they moved on to new cases. Others, like Peter Marillo, kept investigating the possibility that the killer launched another murder spree in a different city. As the years and then the decades passed, the Cleveland Torso murders became increasingly forgotten. For some reason, the Mad Butcher didn't enjoy the same everlasting infamy like other unidentified killers such as Jack the Ripper or the Zodiac, but he did enter local lore as Cleveland's most notorious murderer. In order of body discovery, of the victims of the Butcher. Pertinent details such as the date of death and the appearance of the corpse have been noted in order to compile the behavioral profile. Name, Jane Doe I. Date found, September 5, 1934. Date of death, approximately March 1934 Iberlink. Description, mid to late 30s, approximately 5 feet 6 inches and 120 pounds, white female. Her lower torso, from waist to knees, was found on the shore. Two days later, part of her rib cage and spinal column was uncovered. She had been decapitated and her torso had been cut in half with a sharp knife, denoting some level of anatomical knowledge. Her right arm had been removed shoddily, though, with a saw. Her skin had a reddish hue and it was determined that her body had been preserved with a chemical compound called chloride of lime. Although time of death was gauged at March of 1934, the discovered parts had only been in the water for three or four months. Her head was never found. John Doe 1 Date found, September 23, 1935 Date of death approximately September 13, 1935. Description, mid-forties, about 5 feet 6 inches and 165 pounds, white male. Body, John Doe's body was found, in relatively plain sight, and displayed. He had been decapitated and the cause of death was mid-cervical decapitation. He was also missing his left testicle. His skin had the same, red leathery appearance, but, with this victim, the unsub had quickly lit the body on fire, searing it. Ligature marks on the victim's wrists indicate that they were bound and decapitation may have happened while he was awake. John Doe's head was recovered near the body, buried. Edward Andrus C. Date found, September 23, 1935. Date of death, approximately September 20, 1935. Description, 28 years old, 5 feet 11 inches and 150 pounds, white male. Edward Andrasi was found approximately 30 feet from John Doe 1 on the same day. He had died from a mid-cervical decapitation, complete with ligature marks as well. Like John Doe I, Andrasi was emasculated and his genitals were casually discarded in the foliage. Andrasi's head was found, buried, near the body. Florence Genevieve Polillo Date found, January 26, 1936, torso and arms, February 7, 1936, legs. Date of death, approximately January 25, 
1936. Description, 41 years old, 5 feet 4 inches and 160 pounds, white female. The first pieces of Flo Palilo's body were found behind a marketplace in a small picnic basket, each piece wrapped in newspaper. A two-piece of underwear, wrapped in a newspaper, was found near Palilo's remains. On February 7, 1936, more of Flo Palilo was found, including her legs. She had died from mid-cervical decapitation and was bisected at the waist. She was dismembered, but the skill used in the bisection and decapitation was not evident in her dismemberment. Her limbs were hacked and wrenched from their sockets. Her head was never found. John Doe II, The Tattooed Man Date found, June 5, 1936 Date of death, approximately June 1, 1936 Description, early 30s, 5 feet 11 inches and 165 pounds, white male. The tattooed man's head was found wrapped in his own bloody clothes. A day later, the rest of this body was found. There was no additional mutilation to the tattooed man's body, but he was killed by a mid-cervical decapitation, while awake, due to the contraction of the neck muscles. John Doe 3 Date found, July 22, 1936, the only victim killed or found. Date of death, approximately May 1936. This victim was found decapitated mid-cervical, like other victims. Oddly, this victim was killed where he was found and is the only victim from the west side of Cleveland. The victim's head was found close to the body and wrapped in clothes. The victim was decapitated while still alive and was killed before the tattooed man. John Doe 4 Date found, September 10, 1936 Date of death, September 8 or 9, 1936 Parts of this victim were found in a stagnant pool near the Kingsbury Run area. The cause of death was decapitation, much like the other victims, and this victim was emasculated like Andrasy and John Doe I. Unlike the other male victims, the unsub bisected the torso above the navel. The victim's head was never found. Chain Doe 2 Date found, February 23, 1937 and May 5, 1937 Date of death, February 19 to 21, 1937 Description, 25 to 30 years old, 5 feet 5 inches to 5 feet 8 inches and 120 pounds, white female. This victim was found in the same location as the Lady of the Lake. Initially, Jane Doe II's upper torso, minus her arms, was found. It was determined that she was decapitated post-mortem, which is a definite break from the established pattern. Jane Doe II's lower torso, sans legs, was recovered second. Her head was never found. Rose Wallace Date found, June 6, 1937 Date of death, approximately June 1936 40 years old, petite African-American female. Rose Wallace's remains, skull and torso skeleton, were found, partially buried, in a greasy burlap bag covered in lime. Toe coroner determined that Rose died of mid-cervical decapitation, but no other findings were apparent aside from a missing rib. Oddly, this is the first, and only, African-American victim and, unlike most of the others, was intentionally hidden. John Doe 5 Date found, July 6, 1937 and July 14, 1937 Date of death, approximately July 4, 1937 Approximately 40 years old, white male This victim's upper torso was found floating in the Cuyahoga River in a burlap bag, and the lower torso was found nine days later. The coroner reported the same level of savage rage evidenced by the dismemberment. With this victim, the unsub extracted his organs violently and removed the heart. A piece of the lung was found, but no more organs. The victim's head was never found. Chain Doe 3 Date found, April 8, 1938 and May 2, 1938. Date of death, April 5 or 6, 1938. 20s or 30s, white female. Chain Doe 3's left leg was found in April, with evidence of an enraged dismemberment. In May, 
the remaining body parts in a burlap bag were found. The unsub, at this point, was definitely getting sloppier and a greater deal of rage was evident. Hesitation marks were evidenced as well as what was described as an increasing level of frustration. The head was never found. Jane Doe 4 Date found, August 16, 1938 Date of death, mid-February or April, 1938 Description, 30 to 40 years old, white female Unlike many of the other victims, Jane Doe 3's entire body, in pieces, was found. The cause of death was determined to be mid-cervical decapitation and limbs were dismembered at the joint. The body parts were enclosed in boxes and sacks and her head was found. Jane Doe 3 was found at the same time and in the same location as John Doe 6. John Doe 6 Date found, August 16, 1938 Date of death, December 1937 to February 1938 30 to 40 years old, white male John Doe SIXS remains were found at the same time and place as Jane Doe 3. John Doe SIXS skeletal upper torso and skull were recovered and the cause of death was determined as a mid-cervical decapitation. The head was found in a can. Robert Robertson Date found, July 23, 1950 and July 27, 1950. Date of death, approximately May 1950. Late 30s white male. Much like the earlier crimes, Robert Robertson was decapitated mid-cervical vertebrae. A few of Robertson's limbs were found first, his head and torso four days later. Like earlier victims, Robertson had alcohol issues and was unemployed. Cleveland police have an official consensus calling the Robertson a copycat crime, yet all the files for the Robertson murder are housed with the Kingsbury Run files. This profile is compiled using terminology and denotations as determined by the Federal Bureau of Investigation by review of John Douglas' sexual homicide, patterns and motives. The unsub is approximately, at the time of the canonical murders, 30 to 40 years old. Based on the age of his victims and the relative sophistication of the crimes, he would need to develop the fantasy to the point he is decapitating and bisecting his victims. The unsub has to have a vehicle. The dump locations, sometimes multiple locations for single victims, would require the unsub to possess and operate a vehicle. Within the context of these crimes, that would, generally, dictate the unsub to be more affluent than his victims. Owning and operating an automobile during the Great Depression was a sign of employment, good employment. It can be inferred, then, that the unsub, if not affluent, is professional. In order to dump corpses and pieces, the rudimentary public transportation at the time was unthinkable. He moves within the Kingsbury Run crowd but does not stand out. He either works within, giving aid, or disguises himself to fit into the shanty town. The unsub is physically fit enough to control drunken males and females and dump their bodies in locations citywide. He is strong enough to deviate a person's head from the rest of their body and to dismember a body with hand tools. He is a white male, probably close to six feet tall and right-handed. IQ, the unsub is highly intelligent. He has a knowledge of anatomy as well as police procedure. His fantasy is highly developed, regardless of his victim choices, and he enjoys taunting the police and press. His body staging is indicative of an intelligent prankster at times, enjoying the playfulness of his game. There is some idea of remorse, though. Most of the found heads have been wrapped covered or buried, indicating he did not want to see them again. Two of the heads, the first two men, were buried, but not deep enough to escape detection. The one African-American victim, Rose Wallace, was in a burlap bag and buried deeper than most. The unsub most definitely lives around the Kingsbury Run area. He is familiar with Cleveland in general, but particularly the poor area around the shanty town. The Lady of the Lake is not a good indicator of the unsub's location, even though she was the first known victim since it is apparent that he is mobile and willing to be as patient as possible in victim disposal, over a period of time and over a large area. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation's terminology, this unsub is definitely organized.
murder weapons and ligature are taken from the scene and there is a distinct lack of evidence. The victim pool consists of known prostitutes, unemployed alcoholics, and petty criminals. Each of these people had been ardent to the realities of street life, yet the unsub's ruse or con was so developed that they found themselves at his mercy. His ritual fantasy was very sophisticated and, it appears, culminated in a beheading. The unsub, aside from victim 5, was killed in a different location than where he dumped the bodies. The bodies were posed as well, this includes the breadcrumb trail of limbs that the unsub would sometimes leave. Therefore, he had a large space, remote and quiet, in order to dispatch his victims. Only one victim, victim 10, had evidence of drugs in her system, but the others were intoxicated. It is reasonable to assume that the unsub lures his victims with alcohol, which would presuppose a ruse. The unsub is definitely intelligent and definitely highly organized. It is clear that the unsub chose high-risk victims because of their living conditions. It is reasonable to assume that they will not be missed and, by extrapolation, reasonable to assume that they will not be traced to him. The unsub takes a great deal of time with his victims, with the evidence of ligature marks and the uniqueness of decapitation as evidence. The unsub's level of rage, as evidenced by his mutilations, rose steadily as his career continued. He went from cutting around joints to wrenching arms from sockets, no mutilation to complete evisceration, etc. In his early murders, the bisection of victims was reserved exclusively for his female victims, whereas genital mutilation was reserved exclusively for his male victims. At the point of the second lady in the lake, though, the unsub became more universal in his approach. Decapitation, bisecting, and mutilation, when apparent, became a stock in trade. The remorse evidence by covering, or wrapping, the victims' heads is unique, though. Elliot Ness should have been looking for an aid worker, physician's assistant, or even physician who donated time to the slums of Kingsbury Run. The unsub would appear sympathetic to the plight of the shantytown residents but secretly hate their lifestyles. It would be reasonable to assume that the unsub grew up with a mother and father of lesser means, living in the same type of area as Kingsbury Run. The unsub is taking out his hatred of both of his parents on his victims. He realizes the plight of alcoholism, drug use, and prostitution. He may even believe he is saving these people. The women were bisected through the abdomen, richly preventing them from using their polluted wombs. The genitals of some of the men are mutilated and removed then casually disregarded, indicating that the unsub realizes the pain that the genitals have caused these men. The unsub is fully aware that saving this immoral people requires their dirty bodies to be destroyed. It is conceivable that the wrapping, or covering, of the found heads is another statement by the unsub relating to saving the victims. Even though there is evidence of remorse, the unsub is proud of his accomplishments and engineers the discovery of many of his victims. Some of these discoveries are quite playful, relatively. This video ends here. Don't forget to leave us your opinion in a comment. Thank you for watching.